the underground world inside the earth, Agartha, and the golden city of Shambhala. A Russian philosopher named Nicholas Roig passed through the mountains of Central Asia in 1926, and he and his guides were shocked to witness an incredible golden orb floating in the sky above them. From Chapter 4 of Invisible Eagle, The History of Nazi Occultism by Alan Baker, it stated, high up in the cloudless sky, they clearly saw a golden spheroid object moving from the Altai Mountains of Russia to the north at tremendous speeds. Veering sharply to the southwest, the golden sphere disappeared rapidly behind, behind beyond the Humboldt Mountains. Well, maybe the Russian philosopher Nicholas Rorik shouldn't have been surprised because some claim his journey was no mere expedition. He was trying to return a fragment of the legendary Sintamani stone to its rightful place at the center of Shambhala. The golden sphere was a welcoming sign from within. The Sintamani stone, or Shintamani stone, is a legendary artifact of Buddhist and Hindu mythology a wish-fulfilling gem of extraordinary power. According to Buddhist legend, it fell from the stars and landed in Tibet, and that's where the ancient Buddhists revered it as a spiritual gem. Its power was considered so great and so potentially disastrous, they ultimately sent it to the mystical hidden city of Shambhala. The legend of the Shintamati stone doesn't end there, though. The esoteric theorists and modern-day treasure hunters uncovered profound possibilities. Did the Shintamati stone actually exist? And if so, where is it now, then? Some believe that the true story of the Shintamati stone believe, begins in the binary star system of Sirius. It's interesting that the Dogon people of Mali of Africa reportedly knew of this second star long before modern astronomers knew, but how is that possible? Its physical properties are mostly ordinary, described as a green trapezoid hedron in shape, but its greater powers lie in the higher dimension, invisible to our own senses. It looks like an ordinary rock, but it's actually a powerful pan-dimensional artifact. So this is in fact what the Russian philosopher was trying to return to its proper location. The treasures of the world, the, world Sinta, the word Sintamani itself, can be translated into thought gem or wishing stone. So these golden orbs were in fact trying to welcome the Russian philosopher as he was trying to return the Sintamani stone to its rightful place. And there are prophecies of Shambhala. The legend of Shambhala is found within the teachings of the Kala Chakra or the cycles of time of the Tibetan Buddhism. It is a pure land. It's a circular city in the shape of a lotus flower existing in a space between the physical and the spiritual, perhaps with another dimension. Its capital is known as Kalapa, which is located at the very center of the realm where the king of the world awaits on his throne. So according to these Buddhist teachings, this paradise is only accessible to those with pure intentions and karmic association. Many have attempted to locate Shambhala. Most believe it lies within Inner Asia, perhaps in Himalayas, in the mountain range or within an etheric plain somewhere in the Gobi Desert. The Russian philosopher Rorik himself claimed an entrance to Shambhala was connected via an underground passage to Lasha, the capital of Tibet. But the Russian philosopher Nicholas Rorik wasn't the only one attempting to find an entry into Shambhala. The Nazis sought this, this entries as well, and they sought aid from the mythical city during their many expeditions to Tibet in the 1930s. As far as the rest of us know, it was never found. 
We are left with only a prophecy. When our world is engulfed in war and suffering and all is lost, it is said the king of the world will rise from within Shambhala along with a great army and eradicate the darkness from the earth. An age of peace and prosperity will follow, says the prophecy. So there is a mythology as to the gate to Agartha. There's something more to these old stories and prophecies. The book Beasts, Men and Gods by Ferdinand Ozendowski is an interesting memoir of his experiences in Russia during the Russian Civil War and his journey into Mongolia. And it's not an ordinary story. In one chapter, named The Subterranean Kingdom, he tells of an incident in which his Mongol guide stopped suddenly, dismounted the camels and began to pray, repenting and repeating the words, Om, Om, Mani Padme Hung. When they finished, one of them explained, saying, Did you see, asked the Mongol, how our camels moved their ears in fear? How the herd of horses on the plain stood fixed in attention and how the herds of sheep and cattle lay crouched close to the ground? Did you notice that the birds did not fly? All living things being in fear are involuntarily thrown into a prayer and waiting for their fate. So it was just now. Thus it has always been whenever the king of the world in his subterranean palace prays and searches out the destiny of all peoples on the earth." End quote. Ozendowski learned of the mystery of mysteries, the legend of the kingdom of Agarthi, Agartha as uh, the Hindus and Buddhists call Agartha, as they call Agarthi. He showed a cave or a smoking gate through which locals claimed an old tribe fled into an underground subterranean country. After asking many questions, Osandowski gathered information. He thought it was the, uh, on granting the truth about this mystical realm of Agarti by the prince Shultul Beili. Quote, In it there is not much of, a, of the wonderful. You know that in the two greatest oceans of the east and the west, there were formerly two continents. They disappeared under the water, but their people went into the subterranean kingdom. There are many different peoples and many different tribes. Let's also remember uh, what the Hopi Indians would do and the Hopi prophecy of the blue and red Shekinah. They had also built underground defenses, underground cities, because they wanted to be able to escape and survive uh, floods and global catastrophes by hiding in subterranean cities. And many of them are found in, of course, the United States, the Four Corners regions. And going back to Agartha and the Shambhala underground city, this strange place at the center of the earth has come to be known as Agartha or Agartha. And myths describe it as a place of technological advancement, even flying saucers. A place where high priests and scientists and supreme men, supermen hold incredible power, similar to civilization described by the likes of Raymond Bernard and Olaf Janssen and of course the ancient Greeks. Occasionally, Shambhala is referred to as the city of Agartha. Entrances are said to exist at both poles, the North and the South Poles, or in caverns and tunnels honeycombed throughout the planet. Some believe this civilization is composed of the remnants of Lemuria and Atlantis, the two destroyed continents Osandowski was told of. He was also told that the people of this realm hold the power to, if provoked, quote, explode the whole surface of our planet and transform it into a desert, end quote. So now do these myths and ancient legends or hidden realms and subterranean ancient cities hold any truth? 
Time will tell. I'll leave links below for you for this, these articles. For named Nicholas Roig passed through the mountains of Central Asia in 1926, and he and his guides were shocked to witness an incredible golden orb floating in the sky above them. From Chapter 4 of Invisible Eagle, The History of Nazi Occultism by Alan Baker, it stated, High up in the cloudless sky, they clearly saw a golden spheroid object moving from the Altai Mountains of Russia to the north at tremendous speeds. Veering sharply to the southwest, the golden sphere disappeared rapidly behind, behind The underground world inside the earth, Agartha, and the golden city of Shambhala. A Russian philosopher beyond the Humboldt Mountains. Well, maybe the Russian philosopher Nicholas Rorik shouldn't have been surprised, because some claim his journey was no mere expedition. 